So this is my first ball starter and it was great. It lasted me a good 20 years or so and had a stress fracture in it, but I just kept using it and eventually it did break. When you, when you use a ball starter, you got your muzzle and you want to use your hand to keep it perfectly straight. If you go off this way or this way, it's going to weaken it. Now these new ball starters um, are brass. Brass is a softer metal, just like wood is softer than steel and it protects the cone of your rifle and protecting the cone is very important to accuracy. So ball starters, were they, uh, you know, were they authentic? No. In the old days, okay, I've always told you that men back in the day were a lot tougher than men today. Uh, this was a ball starter back in the day, the thumb. That was it. Um, never seen any examples of any uh, antique ones or ones from antiquity or found any in uh, old shot pouches. I just don't think they existed. But these ball starters are pretty cool because they have secret content, so I want to show you. This uh, looks like just a regular ball starter, brass, right? But if you come to the end of it and you twist it, you twist it open, what you end up with is a pretty cool vent pick. And I'm going to show you what that vent pick is for. It's, uh, it's kind of a neat little tool to have handy just like that. So modern day flintlock has a touch hole liner. And they're also not historically accurate, but I'll tell you something, a touch hole liner can make your flintlock last from now until the end of time. And one of the cool things about having a little vent pick on the end of your, uh, your ball starter is you can get right inside, right inside that little touch hole, clear it out and make a clear path to your powder. So it's a handy little tool. I'm going to show you how it works on a percussion. So here's a percussion. Let's say that you had a failure to fire something, maybe things got clogged up. You got your vent pick, goes right down the center of the nipple. It'll take you right to where the center of the nipple is and you can get down to that powder and make a clear path and get your, uh, get your rifle to shoot. So that's one of the many uh, secret things in a ball starter. I'm going to show you a few other pretty cool features in ball starters. So this is a T-handle and T-handle super, super comfortable. It's a great little uh, ball starter. One of the cool things about having the T-handle is it lets you turn a regular ramrod into a range rod. Fairly easy. This screws right into the end of your ramrod and gives you a nice little range rod, gives you some, some good pressure there and just a nice little handy tool. But it's one of the little secret things uh, that they put on ball starters today. So a little T-handle. Just kind of neat. Some of the little advances in ball starters over the years. Um, whatever one you uh, decide to get, I think you'll, uh, you'll find it's one of the most uh, used pieces of equipment that there is. And uh, if you get a wooden one, nothing wrong with that. Just, uh, just take care. Like I said, this one got me 20 years down the road and a lot of good memories with this ball starter. In fact, that's why I'm not throwing. I'm not a hoarder. I just won't throw this away because of all the good memories. Stay safe, stay warm, stay free. So, Danvers had nine militia companies of various types. Everyone who was between the ages of 16 and 60 would belong to one sort of militia company or another. The younger fellas were in an alarm list. They were the ones who would drop everything at the sound of an alarm and run off to wherever they would need it. The militia would hold back a little bit and wait for orders and then march off together because they were a little older. But 
they were had they had to be well trained, according to Colonel Timothy Pickering of Salem, who was our commander for this area, and he developed a pl easy plan of discipline for the militia, which was about 200 pages long, and went into great detail about how everything should be done. As you may have known, or maybe you don't know, during the during the Revolutionary War. The Americans did not fight from behind trees and stone walls like everybody thinks they did. Other than the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which we'll discuss a little later, they actually did fight in linear tactics, same as the European armies did, because that was considered the honorable way to wage a war, not shooting like an Indian from behind a tree. That was considered cowardly by the British and the French troops. So, they did fire in linear tactics, and they had to know how to report themselves, how to operate their muskets. We'll show the firing sequence itself a little bit later, but some of the different methods for carrying the musket, obviously, the prime position was shoulder your fire lock. Advanced fire lock was another method by which you could carry it in a slightly different position to take the weight off your left arm if you were marching for a while or carrying it for a while. You could also carry a fire lock in your right hand, some also known as trail firearms at some times. Secure fire lock, in case it got rainy or damp, you would cover the lock with your coat because if the lock or powder got wet, you would not fire. Hence the term fair weather the Patriots was a truism back then because if it wasn't good weather, you couldn't fire your muskets. They only had battles during good weather. You could also, as I said, shoulder, slope fire locks. There's another way to take the weight off your arms if you're carrying it for a long time. There probably were a couple of others that I'm not remembering at the moment. Uh, oh, order fire lock is like this. Rest your arms is like this. Uh, also known as easier arms. They use different commands at different times. As far as marching and turning, they had to be able to march smartly in straight rows. And you may notice too, my hat, which is called a cocked hat, because it is cocked a little bit. When you're standing in line, you're supposed to be looking to the right to make sure you're in a straight line with the rest of the troops. So if I had my hat on straight, that obviously wouldn't work, it would hit the musket. So you wore it cocked a little bit, so you could do that. So then to turn, right turn, you step back and turn. Left turn, you step forward and turn. Right about face, you have to grab your uh, cartridge box so it doesn't swing because you're standing so close to the people around you. You step back, turn on your heel, and put your hand down. Right about face, hand there. Turn around, and you're facing forward again. Um, marching is pretty much the same as what it would be today. You would march off in different directions, face, right face, wheels, where the whole line would wheel at one time, sometimes from the end, sometimes from the middle. Uh, so that if you're marching toward an enemy and someone appeared on your left, you could wheel the face so you're facing toward them. So there are a lot of things they had to know how to do. One of the other things that they had to do was fix bayonets. You may have noticed the bayonet on my hip. Maybe you didn't. It is a 14 inch long blade that goes onto the end of the musket. Turns your musket into a seven foot long spear, which when you charge the enemy, was a fearsome weapon. Charge! And the American troops took a long time to get used to using the bayonet. Because you see a bunch of British grenadiers coming at you with their bayonets leveled and howling. It could be rather frightening. But in battle, the troops would fire two or three volleys at the other side, advancing a little closer each time, and then eventually charge bayonets. And whoever left the field obviously lost the battle. So if you kept the field, you won. And it was actually considered more honorable 
to kill someone with a bayonet than with a musket. The musket was just to cause disorder. Uh, Harken back to the old days of fighting with swords. Um, cold steel was more honorable than hot lead. So that's the way they fought battles. Again, rank on rank of men firing at each other. They actually would fire in three ranks. And the front rank would kneel to fire. They fire a volley. Second rank fired and stood in place, fired over their heads. And the rear rank would take a half step to the right and fire between the men in the second rank. So in a volley, you're putting like about probably 300 ball in the air toward the enemy. And it could raise havoc. This is why during the Civil War, when they had more accurate and more powerful weapons, were still using those type of tactics. It was such a bloody war. Because a lot more people get injured or killed by the more superior weapons in the old tactics. What you see I'm wearing is not a uniform, because remember we were civilian militia. We were not, we were not uniformed like the British troops were, the Redcoats, nor the Continental Line that formed later. Even at the beginning of the Revolution, half of the Continental Line was still wearing civilian clothing. We would have been called up in an emergency if an alarm were sounded, and we would basically go and grab our musket and our accoutrements that we were supposed to have with us and appear here at the training field to assemble, to march off to, to take care of whatever emergency it was. So just to give you an idea what I'm carrying, I'm carrying a musket. Sometimes it would be my own, but more often it was supplied by the town. This is actually a Charleville musket, which is a French military musket that the town purchased uh, to supply their troops. The men were supposed to keep that in good condition, keep it cleaned and ready to operate. It's a 69 caliber weapon, and as you'll see a little later, it's operated by Flint. We'll go into that detail a little later though. We also have, and it weighs about 12 pounds. It's a heavy weapon. Some of them are as much as 15 pounds. So that was why they needed different methods of carrying it. You saw the bayonet, which fits over the end of the weapon. There was an earlier form of bayonet that actually looked like a big bowie knife with a narrow handle that actually stuck into the barrel. The problem with that is you could not fire your musket while you had your bayonet attached and if you did happen to stab somebody with it, you then had to go retrieve it, because it would stick in them and not stay on your musket, like these bayonets did. I'm also carrying a cartridge box made of leather with a wooden block inside, which can carry approximately 20 to 24 rounds. The cartridges were made of paper, usually used print or something along that line, and a ball in the bottom of it, tied and then powder on top and as you will see the soldier would bite the top off the thing to expose the cartridge to expose the powder prime his pan and then load it and the town would supply the cartridges as well as the musket and some of the other gear we're wearing is going to be um, I have a hammer sack which is a possibles bag I can put wherever I need to carry with me. Some spare flints, maybe a little bit of jerked meat or cheese to, to eat on the way. Um, sometimes we'd have a um, canteen. I don't have one today with me. I'm also carrying a short sword, which many gentlemen would have carried a sword back those days. Um, coat, waistcoat cocked hat, which I mentioned earlier. Some men wore tricorns. Some men just wore a big uh, floppy flat brimmed hat, because that's what they would have been using probably out in the field when they're farming, just to shave their faces. I'm wearing boots. Most men wore shoes that had buckles. Um, you notice I've got some facial hair, which unfortunately I wasn't about to shave for today, but it would not have been proper in the 1700s. People then were clean shaven. If you look at the old uh, paintings, 
um, the signing of the declaration, all the men were, were bare-faced, no, no facial hair, just was not considered proper. 1600s was a lot of it, 1800s there was, during that period everybody was clean shaven. Trousers um, will look different than today's. Today we have a fly in the front. Back then they had a flap, uh, very similar to the flap on the back of your baby brother's uh, Dr. Denton uh, feet, uh, PJs. Uh, they didn't have zippers yet. Those wouldn't be invented for quite a while. Okay, as we said early, we're going to give a little demonstration now on the musket, how it works, and how they loaded and fired, and the fact of how quickly they were supposed to be able to fire. What I'm going to show you first is how the musket mechanism actually works. As you can see, there is the hammer that has a piece of flint in it, a piece of stone actually, and this is the, called the hammer stall or frizzen. When we and this, I'll open it now to show you this little opening right here they call the pan, which is where the powder would go. A little priming would go there. There's a little tiny hole right here that goes through into the barrel to the main charge. So when I pull the trigger, the flint hits the hammer stall, creates a spark, which we'll see in a second, and then fires the musket. So let me cock it. Now remember, it's not loaded now, but watch for the spark. And that's what causes the musket to fire. So I'm going to back up now and we'll actually go through the firing by commands. The troops would start at shoulder. The first order would be come cast about. Open your pan. Open the pan. Handle your cartridge. And I reach out of my cartridge box, pull out a cartridge. Bite the top off and hold it up here. Prime. Pour a little bit of powder into that. Shut your pan. Back up here to let the officer know I'm ready. Boat. Put the musket down. Load. I will pour the cartridge into the musket, which would have a ball in the bottom of it. Then I'd ram it down and Turn my rammer. Shoulder. Come back to shoulder. The next order would be as ranks make ready. I'm going to turn that fire towards you. Clock the musket. Present. And fire. Back to recover. And then shoulder. We're now going to give a demonstration of a timed firing sequence, just so you can see how difficult it was for them to be able to fire as the manual directed every 15 seconds. So, I'm about to start now. I'm going to turn slightly sideways again. The order would be, prime and load. See, this takes a while to accomplish. As ranks make ready, present, fire! Remember, too, you were supposed to be able to do this quickly while someone's shooting at you. Brakes make ready. Fire! You 
you see this is a lot slower process than modern guns. But they just put bullocks in and pull the trigger. Fire! Theoretically, by the manual, I should have had this loaded and ready to fire this fourth round in less than a minute, and I'm probably going to be closer to two minutes. So I'm stuck on the training field while to learn to do this better. Present. Fire. How long was that? Two minutes. 34 seconds. More than twice as long as it should have taken if I were a well-trained militia. So you can see it's not quite as simple a process as you would think. And as I said, you were standing in line shoulder to shoulder with a hundred more men, probably a hundred yards from a row of the enemy standing at the same distance and shoulder to shoulder firing you. And you have to remember too, because you're shooting in a mass of men, you didn't actually aim. You would just point in the general direction and hope you hit something. And in fact, the French would turn the face the other way to avoid the possibility of getting a flash burn and the arise from the powder going off right here. So that is how the musket operated.